Fans. Welcome to a very special edition of the Peristyle Podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Abraham. As you can see, if you're watching on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Inside Troy, we have a very special guest because we have to preview USC and Tulane in the Cotton Bowl. And uh, we want to do that. Maddie Hudak uh, does a great job covering the Tulane Green Wave. She's a sideline reporter for the radio broadcast. She's joining us. You can follow her uh, on Twitter. Uh, her Twitter is up there on the screen. Uh, Maddie Hudak underscore 94. She also covers uh, the New Orleans Saints. She lives down there in New Orleans. She's a Tulane grad. Who better to have on the show to talk about the Tulane Green Wave than Maddie? Maddie, thanks so much uh, for coming on. Thanks for having me. It's been, a, a, like you said, a blast of a season so far as, as a Tulane alumni. So this has been a great way to cap it off. Yeah, I mean, it's just when you have, I mean, we cover teams and we're going to talk about this. Sometimes you cover a team, they're pretty terrible. <laughs> Like you covered them last year when the when Tulane was two and ten, and then you know they have the best uh, group of five record uh, out there and make it to the Cotton Bowl, the first uh, major bowl bid for Tulane since 1939, I believe. So yeah, you get a, you get a lot of uh, there's a pretty wide range from the two years. Oh, I'll say, and I just to note, I think the last time that Tulane played USC was the Rose Bowl. And that actually funded our basketball stadium that I graduated in. So that <laughs> is about how long it's been. Um, I, it was 1940 was the last major bowl game that they've been in. But yeah, I mean, two and ten to ten to two. It sounds great, but it really is just just incredible to kind of witness. But I saw a lot of what the players were seeing and have kind of explained where yeah, they kind of got blown out by Ole Miss and ECU, and the SMU game was a little rough, but. First time they met Lincoln Riley, they almost beat them yeah. at home, even though that was supposed to be a two-lane home game. And those 27 days in Birmingham really just did drag on, I think, physically and mentally. You know, the nutrition wasn't there. The amenities weren't there. And they had a lot of very close losses where you could see the makings of a good team. There was just no execution. And the players looked a little lost out there. But... They held a meeting held by our, one of our captains, linebacker Nick Anderson, right after the regular season loss to Memphis last year. And he put the conference championship trophy up on like a PowerPoint. And really, they've just been manifesting this since people, you know, say that it's been since July, but it really has been since January of last year. And it sounded crazy at first, but they were so confident that it really made you want to believe them. Yeah, it's uh, to these two teams, there's some similarities, right? You talk about two and 10. Willie Fritz has been the head coach for six years, I believe. And uh, so it was sort of an internal, and we're going to talk about that because there's some interesting things that kind of happened behind the scenes. For USC, you've had a long tenured, not very popular coach in Clay Helton, who gets fired early on in 2010, and they end up uh, going on to a four and eight season, not very good, obviously, in the you know USC traditional power in college football. And then to turn things around, both teams winning 11 games and then meeting in the Cotton Bowl. Uh, it's, you know, there's some interesting parallels, I think, just from both teams out there. Oh, absolutely. And I know that, you know, for, I think for you guys having the college playoff aspirations, it might feel, uh, you know, a little different in that aspect. But I think the matchup is, you know, like you said, it, it, it's, a, it's a good matchup for a good bowl game, if that makes sense. Like, you know, both teams, I think, are able to attack the other's vulnerabilities relatively well and right just to have this kind of turnaround and it almost I mean for us it's felt kind of like a miracle season uh and I, I believe it's the first time Tulane will face the active Heisman Trophy winner in Caleb Williams so uh, we'll be really curious to see you know that quarterback matchup and again kind of getting that second get at Lincoln Riley where I think it is just kind of a little personal for those guys knowing how close they were in that Oklahoma game and kind of the domino effect that happened thereafter. For sure, yeah. So, I mean, there's 
some history there, like you mentioned before, and you know Tulane not facing a, a Heisman Trophy. It's hard, you know, it's it's not always easy to face a uh, you know a reigning Heisman Trophy because they don't come back. But a lot of the younger, you know, especially back in the day, it was like their last game and you'd win the Heisman Trophy. Now guys come back and you see them try to repeat uh, and things like that. But there is an interesting sort of quarterback battle um, here, and like I'll put up a. Uh, a picture of uh, of Michael Pratt, and you know he had he had some a, you know interesting journey with some different offensive coordinators and stuff. Uh, but you know, efficient quarterback, he can take off and run. Uh, at least he did last year, this last year in the offense, and you know doesn't doesn't turn the ball over a lot. So some similarities, like putting up some good numbers, but also takes care of the football. That's really my biggest thing is is taking care of the football. When you look at you know who succeeds in the NFL, I mean turnovers win and lose you football games and. I think one of Michael Pratt's biggest strengths is trying not to be the hero at the expense of the team and, you know, throwing those kind of risky balls into coverage. He takes what the defense gives him. Um, I know I wouldn't consider him a run first quarterback, even though he has really good straight line speed. He is a pocket passer first in that aspect, but just the, I have to also credit the blocking scheme of Tulane this season. I would be remiss not to mention the turnaround with the offensive line, because when you talk about the different offensive coordinators, I just the, the position group coaches as well. It's just been such an astonishing night and day difference from last season. And so just giving him actual time in the pocket to throw and and kind of cultivate relationships with, with receivers where there was just no ability to even do that last year, looking back at the tape, you know, his, his time in the pocket was less than a second at times. And I think some of these receivers, you know, they bring in uh, coach Jim Swoboda, offensive coordinator, who left a head coaching job and you can really feel that pedigree there. He's very patient with his game planning. It just seems like he sees what Michael's strengths are. The offense is designed around that. And the receiver coach, John McMenamin was actually coach Bobo his quarterback in high school. So you have that relationship going there and it's kind of easy to see how those pieces all thread together. But I mean, just to improve his completion percentage in the way that he has, the way he spread the ball out to a bunch of different receivers. I mean, it really, has been a great turnaround season for him, uh, especially getting some stability there after so much turnover. Like you said, it's his third offensive coordinator in three seasons. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that a little bit. I think The Athletic had an interesting story on Tulane. Uh, came out maybe yesterday or, or earlier today. And uh, some of the stuff that I hadn't, you know, kind of read about before, but, you know, what happened? We talked about USC had to turn around. We hire Lincoln Riley and, you know, things get better. But Willie Fritz has been a successful coach. He was the one that took... Georgia Southern, USC fans are familiar because Clay Hilton uh, is the head coach there now, but took Georgia Southern from uh, FCS to FBS, that transition there. Um, you know, I think three bowl games in a row for, for Tulane, just some some big success and then have that two and 10 season. And you mentioned it, you know, you had multiple offensive coordinators uh, year after year. And then this year, you know, going out and hire Jim Svoboda and he was a, he was the head coach at Central Missouri go through spring ball and be like, yeah, this isn't working so well. And then like make a change in the summer to a guy that's already on staff uh, and, and Slade Nagel, like for that doesn't seem like that would work most of the time. Something like that, where you make a change in the summer and say, you know what, you're going to be calling the plays now. And then you have great success. And I, I, you know, you know, Fitz is someone that does like to run the football more. And it seems like they're doing a lot more like 12 personnel. You got two tight ends out there. We'll talk about the running back situation in a little bit, but how did that work over the off season? That had been crazy for you to cover, to go from hiring like a sitting head coach to be your offensive coordinator and then demoting him before you've even played a game. So I'm, I'm kind of confused because I, he is the offensive coordinator. I don't know if that was just something over the summer or because Slade Nagel got promoted to assistant head coach, I believe, as well. Okay. It was. But he's like calling the plays. So like he's running the offense, which is kind of crazy, you know? Yeah. Um, I have to say, I'm not entirely sure about that at that point. That might have been something over the summer, but okay. that, because I, you know, I mean, from what I know, yeah, it's been, you know, Coach Bode, you just spoke earlier. So, I, I'm not entirely sure about that, but I mean, there was just a lot of turnover everywhere. Slade Nagel was one of the few coaches that remain from the 2021 yeah. season. Um, you know, save for the defensive coordinator, Coach Hampton, J.J. McCleskey, Slade Nagel, and, and a few other position group coaches. I mean, cleaned house, absolutely. And I think that really made such a difference. You really see the value of position group coaching. And I think it just speaks again to really leadership of Willie Fritz because a lot of guys, you bring in new position group, 
coaches and they don't have a relationship with them. They don't know what their place is in, in the depth chart at that point. And there was all of the reason to kind of depart at that point. But just to kind of immediately get that stability by saying, yeah, this didn't work. And I think a lot of coaches aren't really willing to do that and actually go through with the moves that it takes. And I would say the most important one really is the hiring of our strength and conditioning coach, Kurt Hester. I think he's been really quintessential in this program's turnaround. You know, when they played that Ole Miss game last year, I always say it just sounded so visceral how outsized they were. The hits on the field just kind of sat, they sounded nightmarish. And he had them really all bought in all off season, uh, you know, because he was kind of running the practices in the off season and he had no idea about last year, but he got these guys all locked in and they all just have such better functional strength. You know, you saw that Kansas State game where they made four four down stops and they were all really sound tackles and, you know, they lose their starting defensive tackle who has 30 pounds on his nearest backup and hadn't really seemed to matter all season because these guys have just had such good again, strength and conditioning all year. So I do think that that was also one of the probably paramount hires and probably one of the bigger difference makers uh, in the turnaround of the program throughout all position groups. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry if there was some confusion there. I just literally hadn't heard that before. I read the athletic story. This I think it was this morning. See, I haven't read the story. Yeah. So maybe I'm genuinely <laughs> missing something here. <laughs> no, I mean, it's, um, and I think the, the, the titles are, I'm sure, still the same, but it sounded like from what, the, and it's an interesting story if you guys are a member, if anyone's a member of Athletic, but he they they sort of had like two different groups in the spring going against each other and like Nagel was running one side and uh, I guess Fitz liked the way the Nagel side was running and made some sort of, at least a little bit of a change in the offensive philosophy as far as that goes, where uh, I think it was a lot, like their the running schemes were different and they just kind of liked the way Nagel was, was doing things, but to keep it copacetic where I don't know if it, I mean like an actual demotion, but you're like, yeah, we're going to let him call the plays or we're going to more run his style. It seems, sounds interesting that they had made that kind of change after, I guess, already making a couple changes over the last couple of years, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm quite honestly have to read this athletic article because <laughs> I, I'm a little, I remember the spring game uh, that you're referring to and it was kind of a wash of a game. They tried to do this thing where they did a draft and the problem was, you know, Michael Pratt had our backup center, and that's just not really yeah. good for anyone. So it was kind of a mess of a game, for lack of a better term. Um, and there was a lot of, you know, I think at that time it was still not like a sense of anxiety, but it did because it was kind of, you know, everyone's back, everyone's here, but, our, our, you know, did everyone make a mistake in coming back? Is one domino kind of going to fall? So I think everyone was kind of just waiting to rip the Band-Aid off in that first game of the season and kind of just get the pressure off. Because I do remember there being a lot of, you know, turnover after turnover for that fact. You know, they hired a few uh, position group coaches who then departed, so they had to replace them. And it was kind of chaotic. So just, again, yeah, to get that stability, despite there being so much chaos in that offseason when they really, you know, needed to get that focus down, it makes it all the more impressive just how they really have focused on – just themselves every game one week at a time that's really been their one and no mantra and just ignoring all of the outside noise because there is just again you know so much uh turnover but then just so much success that I don't think these players were really necessarily expecting to see come fully off in spades so just their laser focus has really stood out to me since spring camp yeah I mean that makes sense because when the now we're in the era of the transfer portal right and if there's anything that's going wrong it could be the team is doing great so there's guys that aren't playing that want to leave or the team's doing poorly and if you have a two and ten season or a four and eight season guys are going to want to leave and then it takes you know you need a good leader you know Willie Fitz at Tulane you know Lincoln Riley comes in does the same thing at USC and you kind of give you have to give them something to shoot for and I guess showing them that conference championship trophy when you're not even thinking about it, when you can only win two games on the year, it's like, that's something, you know? And I, I mean, it's, I think a testament to how Willie Fritz coaches that you can kind of keep the guys, the core group together and build upon that and, you know, have the, you know, incredible turnaround that they did this year. Oh, absolutely. I, I think it says it all because that was really the first year of the NIL transfer portal thing where it was so in flux with all the conference realignment. There was just so much, I think, going on that, and it would have probably been a domino effect, you know, had one or two of the key leaders decided to leave because, you know, Nick Anderson is one, you know, that was a player led meeting where they brought up this idea of the conference championship trophy and they really just 
kind of taken control of the reins several times this season, you know, with all the noise about Willie Fritz and Georgia Tech, the players again, you know, held a player led meeting that Monday and we're like, we're going to block this out and we aren't going to allow that to distract us. And I think that goes back to, again, just the leadership that stops, starts at the top instilled by Willie Fritz. The fact that everyone saw the greener pastures as the ones that they were already at after winning two football games, like it, it's, and I was there every day and I saw it and it's still kind of unbelievable to witness just really believing in yourselves and everyone thinking you're absolutely crazy when you're saying it, because to be honest, you know, when they were saying, Oh, we're going to the conference championship on its face, it sounded pretty absurd, but I just, again, I think that leadership goes through the head coaching to the coaching staff and really just key leaders and, and veteran leaders at that on the team that really weathered that storm. The, uh, the run game obviously has been a big part of the resurgence here. And Tajay Spears is a, you know, pro prospect, uh, like, over 1300 yards, six and a half yards per carry. Uh, what is it, you know, for him, what is it, what has he meant to this team this year? He is one of the heart and souls of this team. You know, he's, you know, oh, Tajay, the player is only rival by Tajay, the person. He just oh, he lights up every room he's in. Everyone roots for him so hard, but he changes the game every time he's in on a snap. You know, the defense has to key in on him. He can catch out there. He can, pass block, he can pick up blitzes, and his ability and his patience and vision back there. Uh, when I saw him in Memphis last year, I, I genuinely said, I feel like I'm looking at Alvin Kamara 2.0, just his elusiveness and his downfield vision. You saw it in that uh, run against UCF where it, it was that absurd, like 73-yard run where he hurdled one of our own players, but you saw him kind of stop for a second and quickly survey about three or four defenders and just see that lane and his burst through it. It's, it's just been a pleasure to witness him. I don't think you kind of come across running backs of this caliber all the time, and he really does feel like something rare and something special and just is so versatile. He's such a complete back. Uh, he's everything you could ask for in that backfield, to be honest. The uh, the Green Wave rushing for almost 200 yards uh, per game. He's, you know, uh, a big part of that, obviously. But, um, you know, we've seen, you know, the, this is a season where the quarterback can take off and run if he has to. I think he's had some success um, the last couple of games, but uh, it, I mean, this seems like a, a run first kind of play action sort of team. Is that right? Very much so. And again, you know, when you have a player a caliber of Tajay Spears, you, you, you know, you design your offense around that, but they do just have such a deep room of running backs there. You know, Iverson Celestine should get a lot of credit for his work in between the tackles. And, you know, when Tajay was kind of having a slower start to the season, he made some really key conversions in that Kansas State game, as did Michael Pratt again with his legs when he had to kind of get it done because that was a really tough defense to throw against. And then, um, you know, Cam Carroll was hurt all season, unfortunately, but shoddy Clayton Johnson, he really came on the second half of the season and just – you have that deep of a running back room and it's headlined by a guy like Tajay Spears, then yeah, it kind of makes sense, you know, and it's a philosophy thing too as well. And I tend to kind of agree with it on a clock control time of possession perspective and not turning the ball over. And again, when you have a quarterback that protects the football like that, it does make sense. Uh, the problem again last year was there, you know, was no blocking and they abandoned the run fairly quickly in the game. So, you know, sometimes they kind of stick to it People might want to see a change, but Tajay is eventually going to break through and keep chipping away at it. So, yeah, it does make sense to kind of design him around that. But we have seen them have to win games in the air, kind of against UCF in that championship game. Those were all really great throws by Michael Pratt, but just the yards after catchability by both Deuce Watts and Shea Wyatt and their contested catchability has been a difference maker. And that was one of the key factors in winning that championship game. You mentioned some of the, the pass catchers. Look, at it, like, you know, there's just a lot of guys that have caught like a decent amount of balls, I think between like 22 and 35 or something. There's like seven different receivers that are sort of in that range. There wasn't, there wasn't like a number one go-to guy. Is that kind of how you describe the, the receiving room? Definitely. And it's, it, you know, you brought up before covering the Saints. It kind of feels like back in the day where, you know, there was no trap receiver on the Saints. Drew Brees had, you know, 15 options and you know yeah there was a few weeks where Tyreek James was really our red zone threat and then Shea Wyatt had a hot streak followed by Deuce Watts so just kind of that ability and just the familiarity with these guys and and working together but again I've just seen them practice every day since training camp or I'm sorry since spring camp and work on these same throws and 
there were some games where the wide receivers needed to execute and they kind of dropped the ball quite literally. But you know, I haven't even brought up Lawrence Keys, for example, who's been a key transfer over from Notre Dame, who's really come on in the second half of the season, his speed alongside Jaquan Jackson. So it makes sense when you look at the fact that, yeah, there might not be a number one receiver necessarily, but they have guys who all could be that number one guy if need be. And it does make for a very fun game to scheme up with them. The uh, you know, Just overall on the offensive side, looking at some of the numbers, um, if you do uh, like a yards per play kind of thing, uh, Tulane's you know number 26 in the nation, 6.41 uh, yards per play. And the uh, SP Plus rankings, they have like uh, – uh, the 43rd ranked offense in the country, um, net points per drive. They're way up at number uh, 18 um, and 2.93 points per drive. So it seems like it's a top 25-ish kind of of offense, but it's one that's, I mean, like we talked, there's there's some, there's a ball control element. You don't turn the ball over that much. So it's sort of just like take the ball and you can keep moving it. You can score, you can get, you know, decent gains, but you're, you're not turning the ball over either and, and giving the other you know, the opponent, any opportunities to score. Right. I mean, if this was fantasy football, everyone would probably hate, you know, two lane matchups <laughs> for that reason. And the same thing with kind of spreading the ball around. But yeah, I mean, again, it's cool. And sometimes when the, when it comes down to it and, you know, like you saw in the Cincinnati game as well, Michael Pratt can execute those throws when need be, but I've never understood kind of the dismissal of the run game when you think about, you know, okay, well, you just took 30 seconds off the clock. You gave the ball back to them. Your defense has had no time to rest, and that's been such an important thing too, you know, giving the defense time, keeping them off the field, especially when you're up against more elusive quarterbacks in the pocket and they might have to do a little more running around that day. So it is, yeah, like I don't like to use the word conservative because then you see them, you know, go for fourth, down in, um, in their own territory to win the game against Kansas State. That shovel pass call that Kai Horton threw in the overtime win against Houston on fourth down was awesome. Yeah. So I wouldn't necessarily call them a conservative offense in that aspect, but conservative in the sense of, again, just really not trying to be the hero at any time and just trying to win a football game, even if it's not pretty. Could be a little methodical, maybe. Is a, maybe yeah. that's a way to... To put it, but yeah, I mean, that's, Belichickian in a way. Yeah, it could be very frustrating, right? I mean, for if it, if you you just never can get the ball back, and you're they're not making you know, you're facing a team that's not making a lot of mistakes, and they keep moving the chains, and uh, and also very good in the red zone, if I'm not mistaken. It seems like you know, especially like the run the ball when you get down inside the twenty. Some some teams struggle; they can move the ball, you know, in the middle of the field. Uh, but Tulane seems to be really good once you get down there into the the money zone. Well, that's where it helps again, you know. Michael, again, being a pocket passer, if he sees a lane, he'll go for it. And that's one of the times that, again, it's just his straight line speed is, is just he's so quick in that short area. And then, again, Tajay Spears. And they run a lot of Wildcat back there, and it's successful. Um, but it's just, again, you know, they have so many weapons back there that, and, again, just a really strong blocking scheme that you got Tajay out there, you have Michael out there. One of those two keeps the ball, and you most likely have a touchdown so you don't even have to kind of worry about the air game at that point. And that's just kind of more uh, added on dressing, if you will. But it also helps, too, that we have such stability at kicker. And I think that's where you see them kind of, you know, go for these situations. But last year, they had to be a lot riskier and really go for it in the red zone all the time because we just didn't have such a solid kicker. But Valentino Ambrosio has really been a key piece in all of this as well because you have seen a lot of drives that don't get to the red zone. Um, and they just wasted, you know, six or seven minutes off the clock. But if you can record three points from 40 yards out, which Tulane can now, that's a game changer for them compared to last season. The uh, Going on the other side of the ball, I mean, if you say, like, the Tulane offense is, is good, I mean, it's it's up there, top 25-ish kind of thing, different metrics. But the defensive side, you could look more, look a little bit more elite. Uh, yards per, per play, uh, number eight in the nation, only allowing 4.73 yards per play, and then on – Points per drive, a top 20 outfit as well. Uh, 1.75 points per drive allowed. Uh, SP Plus has them uh, ranked up in the, at number 30 uh, as the, as far as defensive go in the, in the FBS. But uh, what have you seen from this you know, Tulane defense this year? 
I always say, like, they really do put the angry and wave. They're really just a ferocious three levels of the field defense. And, you know, you talk about the, the stats and the rankings from this season. If you look at last seasons, they were pretty much bottom of the barrel in almost all categories, especially playing zone defense. Like, you know, they were either confused or out of position and or just poor tackling form. And it's it's like everything clicked. Just the linebacker tandem of Dorian Williams and Nick Anderson is probably one of the better duos in FBS football, to be honest with you. They're so complimentary. They have the ability to get into the backfield, rush the passer. They can contain mobile quarterbacks. They can stop the run up the middle. Dorian Williams blitzes the A and B gap all the time. And the secondary has just been such a joy to watch. I'm, you know, a defense-minded person, and I like the secondary. But having some key transfers like Lummy Young coming over from – I believe it was Duke, Jarius Monroe coming from Louisiana Tech, which proved crucial when Jaden Kennedy, our starting cornerback for the first half of the season, went down in our our game against Memphis. You know, that Jarius Monroe made first team All-American Conference Award after basically being a sub in halfway through the season because of his interception totals. I mean, that to me has just been such strong coaching. And I had mentioned before, again, Adonis Freelu, our starting defensive tackle, tore his ACL three days before the season opener. And he was our biggest guy on the line by 30 pounds. And these guys have all stepped up. You know, just the names we're calling in games that you would have never expected that are so far down the depth chart. But everyone's making plays. And that just, it's really been such a well-coached defensive unit. And has that definitely was the reason for the season starting the way that it did. I think the offense came on stronger towards the end of the season. But I don't think they get to the Cotton Bowl today, if not for the, the defense and that start to the season they had, especially in Kansas State. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, you, if that side of the ball is ahead of things, you're, you're mixing things up on the offensive side of the ball, you might need a little bit of time. But it sounds like they kind of complement each other well. Is it a defense that likes to, is there a lot of big plays or a lot of sacks, forced turnovers? What, what kind of, how would you just kind of describe it? They like to keep it in front of them very much so. It's a very much bend, don't break defense. Okay. Um, you know, they like to really disguise coverage. They do like to blitz. Um, they can really you know, do it all, but they play a lot of zone coverage this year, a lot more than they used to. And that, you know, kind of leaves those soft zone holes where you give up those kind of chunk plays. But the idea is not allowing explosive plays. And the only game that that really happened in the air was their loss to Southern Miss, to be honest. And it was very uncharacteristic of them. And they were playing a little man heavier coverage, but, you know, they were just so lost in zone coverage last year. So that's where I just think that veteran leadership, guys like Larry Brooks and, and Lance Robinson, who came back. And the fact that, you know, Macon Clark is excelling at nickel after playing safety last year and Jaden Kennedy played nickel last year and he's it was turned into a starting corner you know those position switches aren't necessarily apples to apples at all especially with the skills required at nickel it's just that they needed a cornerback so that's where Jaden Kennedy moved and then they moved Macon Clark to nickel and it's like he was born to play there he kind of reminds me of CJ Garner Johnson just with this kind of short area quickness and, and disruptiveness so it, it really is just all three levels of that defense are just solid the uh it's going to be an interesting one, I think, you know, um, motivation wise, I, I'm assuming Tulane is highly motivated for this one. Very much so. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, this would really cap off again, a legacy defining moment for, you know, this program's history. Yeah. And at, for on the USC side, they're, they're talking, but I mean, we've seen this happen before where a team is like, oh, you know, like you'd mentioned earlier you have a chance to go to the playoffs and you lose that game. And uh, the, the Pac-12, I believe the losers of the Pac-12 championship game are 0-10 in bowl games. So it's not really, uh, the stats are really uh, kind of there. What are the fan support? Uh, there's, a, I think I have a picture up here. Uh, New Orleans college football team. I, a lot of fans going to come out, do you think, for this one? That people want to come to, to Dallas? I know the travel is kind of crazy right now, but. Yeah, but I mean, we do kind of have that local edge. And I will say that's been such a joy to watch this season, just the fan engagement. You know, they always said, oh, well, if Tulane wins, then people will come. And they were winning all season. People showed up for homecoming, and then they left at halftime when they were up 35 nothing. <laughs> but that AAC championship game, I mean, the student section was packed at an hour and a half before kickoff. People were standing uh, the entire game, making so much noise. I actually did a stadium wave, which I've never seen before, that the student section started. But it really has kind of become, you know, this local darling. I know LSU really rules the state of New Orleans. But if you're not an LSU fan, then most people, you know, again, living in New Orleans, 
I think building Gilman Stadium made such a difference. You know, when I went to Tulane, my first two years, they played at the Superdome. And I mean, Tulane has 6,000 undergraduates and the stadium capacity for the Superdome is 70 to 80,000. So it just looked sad and yeah. no matter how you spun it and people weren't going to get on the buses to go downtown for that. But Yeoman is kind of small but mighty, but it really has made such a difference, I think, in fan engagement. And yeah, I mean, you could really say that they are really New Orleans as the local city's college football team, especially this year. People have really, it, it's just, it's such a feel good story in that way. And again, just the proximity, you know, and there's, there's people that, again, it's been 83 years since they've played in a game of this magnitude. So it's kind of like when the Saints went to the Super Bowl, yeah. my mom and my uncle were immediately on line purchasing tickets to fly down to New Orleans. They're like, this is never going to happen again in my lifetime. I think that's the same sense you're seeing where it, it's, you know, these people have grown old, had grandchildren before Tulane's been back to a game of this magnitude. So I do kind of expect there to be definitely, you know, a presence uh, there. I believe it's next Monday, if I'm correct. Monday, yeah. What's today? We're uh, days are all mixed up. We're we're both yeah. like Christmas traveling and then traveling. Uh, mm. You're you're in New Orleans, right? I mean, you're in Dallas right now, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, I'm flying out there tomorrow, so we'll uh, get that going. I think there's some similarities though with having a major university in a major city where you know there's a lot of stuff to do in L.A. There's a lot of stuff to do in New Orleans. It's a little bit different if you're in like. Athens, Georgia or something. I get, I mean, you're close to Atlanta, but uh, you're in Lincoln, Nebraska. Like there's, you know, it's it. The, the university is it. The football team is it. And uh, there's some different, yeah. uh, you know, different things you got to kind of battle when you're in a city like that. Yeah, especially all the, well, especially in Los Angeles now that there's like three football teams that all uh, oh, professionally yeah, speaking. <laughs> yeah, and, and, you know, two, two lanes uh, benefit. The Saints kind of having a bad season has really helped them get a much deserved spotlight as well because that is kind of the thing where as yeah somewhere like nebraska there is no pro sports it's literally just nebraska football and then nothing else really around it so yeah there's definitely like kind of that urban uh setting of not just being a college town but really being inside you know uh, like you said a major city yeah it's funny i've seen sean payton walking around i live in uh you know hermosa beach and i think he's in manhattan mm -hmm. beach or something so i was like Oh, that's Sean Payton. What's he doing here? I go, oh, he's, you know, he's retired now. So that's got to be kind of yeah. weird. Yeah. For now, at least. <laughs> yeah. His name's coming up uh, a lot. You'd mentioned uh, Willie Fitz. I'll put a picture. Like, so who was, uh, who was looking to hire him? What were the, what were the, the programs that his name came around with? I mean, he got really close with Georgia Tech. You know, all things considered, they got to the point of offering him a contract, but they wanted that deal closed this Sunday leading up to the week of the championship game. And Willie Fritz said, no, like I'm not signing this contract. I'm not leaving this team. I'm coaching them through the bowl game. And so he effectively kind of turned down the job in doing that. But then the way it came out, you know, was Willie Fritz has signed a deal and then that got retracted, but it doesn't matter when something gets retracted nowadays. No. So the original thing and it was, it, it was distracting and not distracting at the same time. It was so distracting in terms of, you know, I, I think Willie just wanted to talk about the matchup and having to kind of keep being asked about that. But again, all things considered, that was kind of blown up in one day. And you don't see that in sports or mo most things for that matter, where you turn down a job, a raise, a power five job on principle. But yeah. he's like, he made a commitment to these guys. And it's, again, why I think... This season, it, it should be less surprising when you look at the character of someone like Willie Fritz, who, again, essentially turned down a job for one more week and one more game. And no one would have blamed him. And most coaches take, you know, you take the job. Right. But he turned it down and he committed to Tulane within two days. And so it was a very dramatic 48 hours that thankfully uh, were over and, and have kind of been put to bed now. Yeah, that's good. All right. Well, Really appreciate the time, uh, you know, hotel room out there in Dallas. I'll be there uh, tomorrow, uh, but it should be should be fun. I've been. Have you been to AT and T before? Or? Well, today was my first day okay. uh, going, and it's it's very weird and surreal and cool to see all the logos plastered all over the place already. Yeah, it's kind of crazy. USC's played there twice. I've been there, um, and they got their their butts kicked. To be honest, <laughs> both times. So we'll see. 
if that the you know if third speaking. time's the charm. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, but it's a lot of fun. So, but Matty Hudak, they're doing a great job uh, covering Tulane. So I really appreciate you coming on and uh, and spending some time and look forward to seeing you out there. Awesome. Thank you for having me. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks uh, for Matty coming on. I'm going to come back and just, we'll take a break and come back and I will uh, answer a few questions. All right, we're back here on the Peristyle Podcast. Uh, I haven't done this much. We are broadcasting, so we didn't really do much of the intro because we had Maddie on. We wanted to uh, be able to uh, kind of get her on and get her thoughts on on what was going on there. So we appreciate uh, her coming on. Um, but yeah, so we this is our regular Peristyle Podcast episode for this week. We're not going to have a two-star recruiting podcast, uh, and we're not going to have one with Chris Trevino. He's traveling I was traveling, but we'll both be traveling uh, tomorrow on the 30th, and we will be uh, at uh, at and for USC practices and, and media events and things like that. And Chris and I will both be uh, at the game covering the team. So we'll be our team from uscfootball.com out there in Dallas. Um, the last two times, like I mentioned before, didn't go very well <laughs> for USC. Um, so we'll see uh, how this one uh, this one goes. Um, should be certainly going to be an interesting game and, uh, you know, looking forward to getting out there and, and seeing one last little bit of USC football. Um, we have some questions. Let me see. Yeah, we'll try to get to these in a second. Oh, but before we jump into all that, uh, if you have any questions in the chat and you want to put in the chat box, you're watching us live on YouTube, you can do that. It's just me right now. So I'll kind of be, um, you know, bouncing back and forth and, and all of that. Uh, but I want to thank our sponsor, uh, Trader Joe's, who's been great to us. We just re-upped with them for another season, another year, uh, covering the team. Uh, it's funny. I did a lot of Trader Joe's shopping uh, over the break and uh, picked up some, you know, just I like the fresh pasta. I picked some of that up last night, and uh, it was a, a basil marinara, an organic basil marinara that I picked up, and it was really good. And then I get the frozen Italian meatballs. Kind of heat it all up together, and uh, it's a nice dinner there. So, but lots of cool stuff uh, going into if you're going to have your New Year's Eve party, things like that. Go over to Trader Joe's, uh, get the wines, the cheeses, the the craft beers, all kinds of fun stuff you can get. And just go to the frozen aisle. I just look at you know, oh, there's like mac and cheese balls. You know, so many cool things in the the frozen food aisle uh, of Trader Joe's you can get, and little snacks. And whenever you go to a party, and you're like, where's that from? I'm like, oh, it's Trader Joe's. Uh, it's kind of cool. Um, okay, so let's do uh, some questions. I think we had a couple of people wrote in. Dan, class of 62, wrote in. Uh, we didn't have Coach Harvey Hyde on this week. He wrote in for that show, but I'll read it here. Thank you for your insights during the football season, which was by all odds the most successful despite the playoff loss. Uh, means the championship game loss, I think. USC should win the Cotton Bowl and be highly ranked in the 2023 preseason polls. Having the Heisman winner is great for future recruiting as well. The glass is definitely more than half full for future playoff success. My only regret is that I can't seem to get a football media guide from the bookstore. Is the athletic department still printing the media guides for fan purchase prior to the past two seasons of collection of every year since they first sold in 1980? Best wishes. Happy holidays. Dan of Class of 62. Yeah, um, Dan, I'm sorry. I don't think they do them anymore. They It's digital. Um, but we, I have, actually, I could show you on the video, but uh, I have a bunch of them um, from the 90s on. I would collect them too because I would get them, well, for work. And uh, But we haven't got a printed one um, for quite a while. So I'll let you know about that. Jared also wrote in, and he has a drinking game. Now, Jared, I'm going to, this is a lot. He wrote a lot, and then he sent a, a video that's like an hour long. So if you want to go post it over at the uscfootball.com on the Peristyle on the message board, people can kind of check it out there. But it's essentially a drinking game that he created and shows highlights from different uh, eras of USC football, different games, powerful game, you know, big games. And uh, then he had, um, whenever you would hear Conquest, you would do a shot of beer. So he had a kind of interesting game there, but you can go check it out. Jared, you might want to post that on the Peristyle or something because it's really hard to talk about that on an audio uh, podcast. We have other couple questions here on our YouTube channel. I will try to read these for you. Let me pull them up. Uh, from Roger, it's hard to tell how much effort USC will expend. Uh, will Caleb Williams play? This makes it hard to predict. So the, the conversation was talking about 
you know, will USC be up for this game? We talked about it with Maddie. Like, obviously, Tulane is going to be up for this game. Uh, 80 years or whatever since your last big bowl game. Um, but I feel like if you look at the way Lincoln Riley put the roster together, and would you say, you know, there's a lot of guys that were out for themselves or whatever. Like, if, like, Travis Dye wasn't hurt, he'd be playing in this game. Uh, even Jordan Addison, I think there's a chance that he would be playing if there wasn't that injury there kind of getting ready. Guys that can play, I think are going to play. I think they want this. And I think you would love to be, you know, 12 and two. I think that's, there's just something and, you know, winning the cotton bowl. There's something to be said for doing that. You know, I watched the holiday bowl last night and uh, to see Oregon win that game, you know, by a point on a doinked PAT at the last second. I mean, that's something. And there's, there's something to winning these games. Now you're talking about hurting, you know, 80, 90, 17 to 22 year olds, uh, you know, into a city for a week and try to get them all on the same page. Not always easy, but I would give Lincoln Riley credit because what he's done so far, it looks like he's been able to do that. There's a lot of opportunity to be like, ah, why would those guys care about it? But they do. Um, he put a, a team together that yes, pieces were from all over the place. You could say it was a bunch of mercenaries, but obviously it wasn't. They have team chemistry. And I think having that team chemistry throughout the year and them getting back to what you're hearing from them say, getting back to uh, the basics of what they do every week, why they're working, I can't see them really working differently and uh, not taking this seriously. So uh, we'll see. See if I'm right or wrong on that one. Um, we got another question here. Let me pull it up for you. Uh, Gixer Squid, USC needs to simply win because we do not want to go into the offseason with a loss to Tulane. Not good from an optic perspective for recruiting. I mean, I think for the recruiting aspect, uh, it's something. If you if you watch the uh, the live show that um, Gerard and Chris Trevino did, and Gerard talked about this, we were at the Army All-American Bowl in San Antonio. That's what it was called at the time. It's not that anymore. And USC was losing to Georgia Tech while practice was going on. Like Max Brown, a whole bunch of big recruits that were there and asking us for like updates of what's going on. It was not a good look. Um, so that's different now because like their class is signed and all that. But, you know, so for the future, that I mean, that there was a lot of problems with that one. But for the future, yeah, I think it, it helps. And just, you know, USC, USC hadn't won 12 games since 2008. So, you know, go out there and, and win. I think that's important. So um, here's one from Manford. Let me pull up. Are you still planning a meet and greet? We have not uh, planned that. So my apologies for that. Um, but yeah, I would like to do something. I need to chat with, uh, chat with people. It's just been a lot with the holiday travel and things like that. Um, but yeah, let's, I'll try to do, put something together. Um, but it's getting kind of late for that. Sorry. Uh, from Kings fan, how do you see the game going? Uh, and that's interesting. I don't really know. Um, I, I don't. I feel like USC is going to be motivated for this one. Uh, a lot of it has to depend on Caleb Williams playing. We haven't seen anything or heard anything that would say he wasn't going to play. Um, so that's good. But, I mean, he's he's a huge part of this team. And, uh, you know, you're going to have a couple offensive linemen out. You got Gino Quinones going to be starting. Uh, you know, I think receiver-wise, they'll be fine without Jordan Addison. But it's, you know, it's something um, to not have some of your pieces. And we saw it kind of, you know, cause some problems. And Tulane's just really good at stuff. Like, they're good on defense. They can hold the ball on offense. Um, they're not going to turn the ball over. And USC's done better when they've forced a bunch of turnovers. So, um yeah, so we'll kind of see what's going on there. Uh, let's see. Megan has a question. Uh, you said that the last two games for USC didn't go so well. Uh, what do they need to do to win this game? Well, those they were overmatched athletically in those games. You know, at Alabama, who's Alabama, and you had a Clay Hilton USC, who's USC, but not not USC, USC. And then Ohio State. And uh, that was the year USC won. That was in the Cotton Bowl, actually. And USC won the Pac-12, but you know, they played a couple good teams and lost to them, uh, you know. And so you, the, 
the tougher teams they played, they lost. And you knew Ohio State was going to be tough. This was Urban Meyer, you know. And you look at the defensive linemen for Ohio State. They were just big, strong, fast, all that kind of stuff. Um, and that didn't bode well for USC in either one. And the Ohio State one wasn't as blowouty as it could have been. But, you know, it was just sort of like Urban Meyer took control of the game and just kind of cruised. But USC didn't score a lot in either one of those. I think the difference will be USC is going to score in this game. Uh, but can you stop Tulane? Um, you got a great running back. Spears is awesome. Uh, you have a quarterback that can run. They're really good in the red zone. You know, if you're not getting those turnovers, which they don't do a lot of, uh, can you get stops? Can you force punts? Can you get off the field? That'll be what you got to have to watch for. See, um, these, these questions about like, what's going on, like what, uh, where these events are. I don't really know. Well, traveler, travel a cotton bowl. Um, I don't know. There will be a rental horse. They don't do that. But uh, I don't know if Traveler's going. I will try to find out um, what's going on there. Uh, let's see. And we'll do one last one. SC Neal, uh, based on Shotgun's pick from Tuesday's practice showing Caleb Williams sprints, is it fair to say Caleb Williams will start? I mean, it's a great question. I don't know. Um, we'll try to get as much information when we get there tomorrow of uh, what's going on. There's, you know, they were at like the children's hospital yesterday. Um, and, you know, we've, we've got some pictures and we got stuff up going up on the site. We'll have notes for practices and things. There's one going on right now, actually, uh, while we're talking, there's a practice going on and, uh, shout out. Um, so we ha actually have, uh, Andrew Hattersley, who covers, uh, Texas A&M for 24 seven sports. He lives in Dallas and, uh, he's helping us out, uh, with the coverage down there until Chris and I get there. So, uh, thanks for that for, for Andrew, for, for going down there, but yeah, it, my guess is he's going to play, but it's, it's really kind of hard to say. Uh, all right. Well, I think that's going to, uh, wrap things up. Wanted to get a show in in between the Christmas and new year, kind of crazy break, but it was awesome that Maddie could come on and kind of share some insights and, uh, yeah, apologies. That I definitely would go recommend that athletic story because the way it, the way I read it this morning was like they made a change on the offense over the summer and uh, it very well could be it wasn't a, a public change like people didn't talk about it very much and this was uh, and you know this was sort of like a new development so we'll we'll see what we can find out about it but um, yeah when you hire like a sitting head coach who's running a certain offense and bring them in and don't like the way it looks in the spring and then change things up. Um, they, you know, they, from my understanding from the story was that, uh, they had, they were going to run this, a lot of 11 personnel, one tight end, one running back. And it wasn't really, these offenses weren't really kind of, uh, top 25 rushing offenses, which is something that Willie Fritz, uh, wants. And then they changed things up. It wasn't the outside zone screen. They did a lot more of the gap stuff. You're running in between tackles and you got Spears, who's not a big running back who can kind of hide behind pulling guards, pulling tackles, things like that. And it just worked. Um, but that was my understanding from the story. Go check it out. And I will ask, I'll ask some questions. Uh, I felt bad. I didn't want to put uh, Maddie on the spot or anything, but maybe it was something that just wasn't um, known and wasn't talked about that much uh, until the story came out. But I thought it was really interesting. And I just read it this morning. So I thought I'd uh, kind of talk about it. So um, let me put this one up here from Roger, because I want to say the same sentiment. Happy New Year, everyone. Uh, appreciate uh, all of you being a part of the uh, Peristyle Podcast family, Tunnel Vision, uscfootball.com, of course, over on the Peristyle. It's been so much fun this past year. I can't tell you how different it's been um, covering this team. That was what you saw in 2021 to 2022, completely different. And I'm sure it's a lot more fun for all of you out there. I know there's still some naysayers and people want to complain and maybe that's like the eight or nine years or longer of complaining that's been going on that you kind of hard to kind of brush that off of you but i would recommend brushing it off a little bit this is a this is a good season you know is everything going exactly the way you want no but it, i think they're going ahead of schedule higher than expectations so uh usc fans recommend putting your trust in lincoln riley he seems to know what he's doing and uh, we will see how it goes uh, on monday uh, in Dallas for the Cotton Bowl. But I'm going to sign it out. Thanks for Maddie for joining us. This will be our last podcast of the year. Good thing because my voice is going out. And then we'll do, uh, we'll have early January when we get back from either in Dallas or getting back from Dallas. 
we'll do some shows and reactions to whatever happens with USC and Tulane in the Cotton Bowl. So hope you guys all enjoyed the show. Thanks for tuning in. Appreciate if you were listening on the podcast, on our Parasol Podcast um, Network or over on YouTube watching live or replay. So thank you very much for doing that. And we will talk to you next time.